in this subject because of a course I took uh, when I was at Candler, uh, doing some work at Candler. And I got so fascinated by this whole concept of the different ways Jesus and the Christ are um, pictured, not only through the centuries, but around the world, that I got really into this. Now, I'm not an expert, so this is very much a lay thing. But last week, I did a really quick review of what seems to be the history of how Jesus got portrayed. And we started with very early portrayals in the catacombs of a very pastoral Jesus with goats as well as lambs, I want to point out. That's very reassuring, isn't it? And we think part of the reason for this is it was much safer at the time, while Christianity was still illegal, if you will, to have these really non-threatening pictures that could be of something other than Jesus, right? A pastoral scene. Or they had scenes of the parables, the woman at the well. But by the fourth century, uh, Christianity was legal. Certainly by the end of the fourth century, it was the state religion. Constantine did that. So the whole way Christianity gets portrayed shifts over time to a much more magisterial, Jesus all-powerful, rather than this real pastoral way of presenting Jesus. So here we see Jesus dressed as an emperor in purple, in the halo, and all the rest of that. And here we see Jesus as a warrior by the 6th century. And here, Christ in majesty with the angels. So in, what, 500 years, a few hundred years, we've gone from this very pastoral way of portraying Jesus to Jesus as ruler of all, if you will. Now, I'm way oversimplifying. I'm well aware of that. We just did, what, 500 years of history in about a minute? <laughs> But it's just general trends that I wanted to point out. And then later, we're doing this, and then we're going to uh, go into much more contemporary um, imagery. But during the Middle Ages, we start seeing a lot more images of the crucifixion um, for a variety of reasons, scholars think, partly because of uh, the Franciscans were, had, had been uh, started, and they were much more portraying of a very earthly Jesus, a Jesus who suffered and there's much more of a focus on Jesus' death than we had seen before. Not that there weren't cruci you know, crucified Jesus figures before, but we're seeing a bigger emphasis on that, and they're getting more realistic through the centuries. This is 14th century. This is 15th. We looked at these all last week, okay, and then this is Rubens in the 16th century. You're starting to see a lot of detail and much more of a, of a realistic portrayal, if you will, of the crucifixion. Um, we also have noticed, so I've now done 1,500 years and 30 seconds. Uh, we've also noticed that, I love Paige Love, thank you, because she said, you know, this was a branding for Jesus, the brown hair, the halo, the beard. That way, artists could use that figure and we knew it was Jesus. That's one reason for it, I'm sure. You will notice, please, that none of these look Semitic at all. Just keep that in your head. <laughs> and here we are by the 16th century, Titian, beautiful portrait, but it's still the brown hair, the beard, the whole thing, and a very Northern Europe, a very European looking Jesus. You know. I know this is shocking, but he was a Jew from the Middle East. So these aren't, I don't think, really attempts to portray him accurately, but this is the way that he was portrayed. And then we look at, we see this one in the 20th century. And um, Regina tells me I talked about this one a lot last week. I'm sorry. I grew up with this, and I'm fighting hard to move away from it in my head, you know, because most of us are very familiar with this picture of Jesus. It was done by Walter Salman in 1941, and half a billion of them were distributed around the world during the 20th century, and that's why you see them everywhere. Is he in America? Was he in America? Oh, yes. Just like Robert Taylor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I guess I was sort of comforting myself, oops, sorry, comforting myself 
thinking, well, you know, that was mid-century and we've gotten more sophisticated and you see a lot more uh, ethnic Jesus figures now, which we will look at. But I go to meetings of another organization in a church near where I live, not affiliated with the church, we just rent the space. And this, there's this figure in one of the rooms we use. <laughs> so what do you think of this? A blonde, blue-haired Jesus. Notice he doesn't even have roots. He's really blonde. <laughs> Um, and on the, I couldn't find out, there's no indication of who created it. There's a name scribbled on the back, might have been the donor. My guess is somebody important in the church donated it to the church, and so they had to display it because there's some other not wonderful Christian art in that room. And there isn't anybody, I didn't feel I could ask any quiz people at the church about, why are you putting that thing up? But they, they, their website says they're an inclusive church. So. <laughs> Well, there is a little phrase on the back referring to the, not with a, not with a verse, Bible verse, but it's a supposedly, uh, this is Jesus looking at Peter after he denied him the third time. I find, personally find this disturbing on many levels. Very. Huh? The look is, I think the blonde, blue-eyed Jesus is just over the top, kind of creepy, you know? The waves. The waves. <laughs> so this is the Jesus, I guess, <laughs> that has been so dominant, the white Jesus, the Caucasian Jesus, uh, certainly in this country. James Cone, in his book, uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, I think he talks about this and that slaves took this Jesus and made it really mean something for them relating to the suffering of Jesus, even though they were given a white Jesus by their owners. They appropriated that Jesus and found enormous comfort. So I don't want to always um, mock it, but it still troubles me that we are giving a that a white Jesus is being pre has been presented to people of color everywhere. It just, I find it personally very troubling. I asked Angela, just after church yes, uh, last week, um, what she saw growing up in the black Episcopal church in this country. She said, oh, white Jesus. So, um, and she shared with me some wonderful pictures she took when she was in Africa and Peru. I think this is rather striking. Christ Church Cathedral in Ghana, in Cape Coast, Ghana. Now, I, I wanted to ask Angela, are Anglican churches, at least in Ghana, highly Anglo-Catholic? Because that's a very Catholic, yeah. sacred heart image. Yeah. I was a little surprised to see it. It, it depends who were the first colonizers and which part of England or they came from. The next African world, more on the east, they're um, well, more evangelical and missionary societies, societies than some of the blue and some of the Roman Catholic. Depends who the conqueror was, Spain or... Yeah. So the conquerors and the missionaries have a lot to answer for, I guess. And then she shared, this is from the Anglican Church in Accra. Again, a very a white, totally white Jesus and crucifix. Look at his arms in relation to the rest of his I know, it's not great art. It's not great art. And he doesn't have hair on his chest in his picture either. Yeah. You should think that Jesus would have hair on his chest, you know. But she showed me another one at the seminary in Ghana. I love this. Wonderful sculpture. Unfortunately, 
you can, can't really tell on the left that metal thing. It's a fan right in front of the face, and so she had to come to the side to get a picture of it. So I didn't want to imply that every Jesus in African churches is white, but I find that one very wonderful. No, I'm just comparing the picture. Of the Kurdish people, I know that a lot of them have blue and light eyes, and they have light skin. Yeah. And some of them have white hair. And a lot of that, I think it comes from the Nordsmen who came down and um, fought with whomever. And I don't know when that happened. But <clears throat> that's a pretty old culture. You know, if you know that. It is, and there are some who, not accepted scholarly, but who argue that there were Norse influences in Galilee. Um, and I'm not saying any of this is really wrong, but I personally prefer a more varied way of, yeah. of depicting no, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Then she gave, uh, Angela also gave me one from Peru, undoubtedly a Catholic church. Now I love this, it covers all the bases. You've got a black Jesus, and then over up there on the side, you have Jesus and Joseph and Mary who are white. Maybe this is just, they don't care, you know? Uh, and I th she said it's an unknown church. I'm assuming it's Catholic, but you never know. Anyway, I really appreciated her sharing these pictures with me uh, to give us some context. Now, we do start seeing a lot more ethnic-based Jesus figures during the 20th century. I know, I don't think you would have seen much of them before then, certainly the middle of the 20th century, but I you know, haven't really done a lot of research on this. Um, if you look up black Jesus on the web, don't, because <laughs> you get a lot of real strange stuff. And uh, there was a Adult Swim program named that a few years ago, and it caused all <laughs> kinds of controversy, and I really don't want to wade, wade through all of that. But from the class I took, I do have some, there's some wonderful, wonderful images. This is uh, Black Jesus with a Lamb, which I think is really... I mean, there are those who argue Jesus was black. I'm not getting into that argument at all. You know, as Angela also said, that remember, after the resurrection, Jesus is all of us and for all of us, and that's how you can have these very different representations of, of Jesus for, for all of us. Okay. Now, this next one is, is really disturbing to me in many ways, a black Jesus, of course, on the cross. Actually, this brings up for me lynching. Black. Lynching. Yes. Which actually, the crucifixion was, but somehow I find this an extraordinarily powerful image, bringing back all that awful history in our country as well. And I actually enjoyed this one because this is a Jesus of color triumphant as opposed to suffering. And again, I don't know the derivation of this. I got it from the class I took, and the, and the person who taught it is actually retired and no longer living in the U.S., so... And then there's this one. Bev brought this. I think it's wonderful. The National Catholic Reporter had a contest in 2000 um, and about the best depiction of Jesus for our times. And this is the winner. And Bev brought, brought that one, Jesus of the People, which is a very different way of, of portraying Jesus. But as you were pointing out with the Navajo Jesus and so on, there's certainly been many other uh, depictions of Jesus fitting in with the local culture. And uh, so I have a few of those. And then we're gonna well, look. I, can I just say, sure. I, so I, the, I've forgotten about the, um, the feather on the, oh, on the yes. cross. Oh, uh yes. -huh. So um, that's the one Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a few from other parts of the world. This is a Jesus from China. I guess that's a sort of halo. And I'm not quite sure how we know this is Jesus, but. That's why I thought about that circle. Maybe an Asian reference, because the surgery was showing you she uh huh. Oh, from the one we were just looking at? Uh -huh. Yeah. And then here's, I love this, it's Korean, and this is uh, Jesus and the woman who's being stoned for adultery. Look at these two guys. Yeah. And then there's a wonderful artist, India, his name is Frank Wesley, although he was Indian, but a long, I love this, long history of his family being Methodist, so there we get Frank Wesley. And he did a lot of Christian art, but in an Indian setting, which is, I think, very, very interesting. And of course, this is Jesus working with his father, and he's blue because that is Krishna, so you have the reference to Hindu as well. The Holy One, yes, yes. And there are those who argue that he went to, that Jesus went to India. So is that his mother, and she's in Korea? Probably. I don't know. Maybe another reference to the Hindu gods or goddesses. And then another of his paintings, the wedding at Cana. See, that's very gender neutral too. Yeah, you know, it is. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Then I love this guy, the Guru Jesus, <laughs> and this is on the teak, and I cannot find a dare of it, you know, any kind of attribution for it, and. Uh, but there you have the combination of the Christian symbolism with Indian. Um, Hindu. Anyway, I love, and he's, you know, there's the blessing sign and the halo. And now a more controversial one. I promised we would talk about this. Even more controversial. This is Krista, uh, the woman on the cross, which was created in 1974. And in 1984, um, they mounted it as part of an exhibition at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. And it lasted 11 days because the bishop required that they remove it. And here's what the suffragan bishop said, symbolically reprehensible, theologically and historically indefensible, and totally changing the symbol. I know, not for women. But isn't it interesting, the strength of that reaction? They got, there was apparently general, you know, positive reactions, but a very vocal minority with lots of hate mail around this. And they, and argued it over-sexualized Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It's okay if it's a naked man, but if it's a naked woman, it's too sexy. Yes? So just kind of to move with what you said that I said earlier, the sure. pregnant, to kind of expand upon that. So I remember seeing the Chris on the cross when I was in seminary, it was in the bookstore, not as graphic as this, uh -huh. but a different image, clearly feminine. So my whole stance on this is that Jesus was clearly a man, historical person, sure. lived, looked a certain way. However, after the resurrection, we see that Jesus' appearance, as you already mentioned, people didn't recognize him until he, they heard his voice in some instances. And so we have, in, as the resurrected Christ, an opportunity to imagine Jesus the Christ in a different way beyond the physicality that was known back then. And so for me, having a Krista is fine as long as Krista is not on the cross. Because Jesus was on the cross. Ah, okay. And you have a Krista in a different context. Yeah, what does it make it for me? What's the size of this? Do you know, like, how 
pretty good size. Is it like yeah. Or? Yeah. Now, interestingly, in 2016, Saint John the Divine had a, an exhibit again on the female divine and brought it back, and there was much less controversy 40 years later. But there were still some objections, you know. But I appreciate your point of view. That's very interesting. Good yes. point. Mm -hmm. Art always has an artistic license, and you know this could could easily be an expression of the feminine in Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just showing that he, he has the feminine qualities. And a lot of feminist theologians see this as an identification with the suffering of women. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one. I found that just, when I saw this personally, it took my breath away. In ways the other one didn't as much, maybe because of the, a different way of portraying. Um, and actually the artist here did not plan for this to be a Jesus figure, as you will, if you will, but it immediately got interpreted that way. Again, controversial, controversial. it's at the University of Toronto but it took them three years after it was offered to accept it and display it. So it is quite controversial, it was. Uh, for me personally, of course Jesus wasn't a woman, but it helped me to see that Jesus could have been anyone. God chose to become incarnate as Jesus of, of Nazareth, but God could have chosen a woman instead or anyone, and somehow that gave me Jesus, personally. Opened all the possibilities for me. Now everybody's gonna look at this differently, but yeah. I, I, was, I was just gonna add, I feel the same way. I think the reason that some people find this, uh, find this offensive is the same reason that they find a black Jesus or a Navajo Jesus offensive, because it forces you to expand past this very narrow definition yeah. of what Jesus was. And, you know, it makes it not simple. It makes it complex. Yes. And I think that's hard. Right? It's hard for people to accept that, that complexity. Yes. Very challenging. Very yes. Challenging. Now, a couple of images were mentioned last week. I uh, just wanted to be sure I followed through. Uh, Pete mentioned the Salvador Dali Jesus, which is very interesting. You notice it's way high above, and then there are fishermen down there. So it's a Jesus. Again, it may be theologically challenging because the risen Jesus is not on the cross. But Dolly chose to do this one, it's rather well known. You're supposed to lie down on the floor when you see that. Oh, really? It gives you the. I tried it and it didn't. I prefer it looking at it like that. Where is it? Uh, it's not in the United States, but it was here when I was. It was in the high. And they said you should lie on the floor to look at it? You're to look oh. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we could spend the rest of the week looking at lots of different portrayals of Jesus. There's just this, is, I'm just barely scratching the surface. But here's one that John mentioned that I thought really deserves some conversation the homeless Jesus, which was created in 2013. And if you'll notice, you can identify it as Jesus because of the marks in his feet, of the nails. It did. Well, there are a hundred of them around the world. One of the first casts went to an Episcopal church in North Carolina, St. Albans, and it was controversial. Um, let me look at my notes. I like that there's space on the bench for someone to sit. Well, the, the rector there says that is what has happened. But NPR did, huh? But not much space. I no. Mean, so it's inconvenient, and that's, um, uh, it's, it's. And you have to be very close. Right. You see what it is. Yeah. So the reaction to the cast was immediate. Some loved it, some didn't. This is according to the rector. Some residents felt it was an insulting depiction of Jesus that demeaned the neighborhood. Because it was a well-off neighborhood, so you don't want homeless people there. Isn't that something? 
One woman called the police thinking it was a homeless person to have it removed. So it shows when you start messing with the image of Jesus, it really gets people, it really touches people in ways you wouldn't expect. Um, Another neighbor wrote a letter saying it creeped him out. I guess that's the point, right? You know? Uh, just what an interesting reaction when Jesus teaches take care of the poor and the homeless. Jesus was homeless, actually. It How, shatters the comfortable assumptions. Yes. It causes you to confront um, yeah. something that might be familiar in your circumstance and see it through different eyes. Um, a homeless person. But, on a more positive note, the rector said residents are often seen sitting on the bench alongside the statue, resting their hands on Jesus and praying. Thank you all for a great conversation.